I'm Nancy Lee. I'm a professor at Elmhurst College in Religious Studies, and my area is Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. Sure. Um, Hanevia and Hannah, uh, women biblical prophets in a women's lyrical tradition. Um, Hanevia is simply the Hebrew word for the woman prophet. It's kind of a generic term. It's not a name, really. Um, and um, the book is about uh, my own search for women's voices, prophetic voices, embedded in biblical text where they're not attributed or they're not named. Um, this is really continuing a scholarly question that um, a few people have raised um, as to whether or not we can find those women's voices um, in the text. And heretofore, we haven't really had a way to do that beyond kind of looking at women's genres that they might typically sing or looking for feminine grammatical forms that might signal a woman's presence in the text. Um, or in some cases, trying to figure out what is a woman's perspective, but you know that's a little bit problematic because what is a woman's perspective? I mean, you're going to have a diversity of views from different women on different issues. So, um, my attempt is to see if I couldn't find within the Hebrew um, any sort of uh, signal or uh, uh, suggestion of a woman's style of composing, and so that's what the book is trying to to basically do. Let me say that instead of favoring one method over all others, my, my, in my career I've tried to integrate approaches. And I think, you know, to, to, to glean from the, the findings of different ones like that is the best way to get at the text and how it works. Um, I haven't dwelled heavily on theory in the book because I really wanted to focus on the text and see what I found. So that, I guess, is a kind of um, uh, method also. Um, so basically what I did was I began with the book of Isaiah. The reason for that was um, in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 3, there's one verse that mentions that the male prophet Isaiah um, was partnered to a woman, presumably his wife, and they had a child. And there's one verse that suggests, you know, what they named the child, and it has a bearing on that context. Well, um, this woman is called Hanevia, the woman prophet. So because we know that, at least from that verse, the male prophet is married to a woman prophet, it made sense to me if I was going to look for um, a woman prophet's voice embedded in texts, that that would be a good book to start with. So that's what I did, and I just began actually going from chapter 1 and examining the Hebrew, trying to uh, really get a sense of what, the, in this case, the male prophet is attributed as opening the book. and his first oracle, chapter 1, what was going on with the artistry of the Hebrew. And what came to fore pretty quickly for me, and other people have observed some of these aspects, it's not new, um, that he used a doublet sound play pattern. By that, um, I mean he might repeat a word twice, or he, he will repeat syllables beginning with a particular consonant twice, um, pervasively. So through the whole first oracle, you get, you know, the word for people, um, um, twice. You know, you get children, banim, banim, twice. You get the word not, not. They have not done this. They have not done that. Low, low, twice. And so um, as I continued to go through the first poetic oracles in the book of Isaiah, I continued to see this doublet pattern. And not only that, but then he would have multi multifold, uh, like eightfold uh, pattern, uh, an eightfold pattern. Um, so this was pretty pretty evident to me that here was a stylistic feature. Now, okay, I can say the representative voice of the male prophet Isaiah, that, that's part of that rhetoric. Well, okay, so I kept going. I came to chapter 5, and all of a sudden the sound pattern shift, shifted to a triplet sound play. So in other words, um, um, this voice, for example, the word vineyard, keterim, is twice, but then Karen, a hill. So Karen, Karen, Karen. So a triplet kind of sound play, right? Now, th when I say doublet or triplet, I don't just mean a doubled word or a tripled word. I mean doublet of a, of a syllable or a triplet of a syllable. So the letter, the K sound, you know, 
this this voice might use the the K sound at the beginning of a word three times, or the B sound, that kind of thing. And it can also be embedded within a word. So it's kind of wild. All of a sudden, I saw this new pattern. That what what's going on here? Is this a different voice? Is it because it's a different genre? Because this, in chapter five, it opens up the song of a vineyard, a vineyard song, you know, and um, kind of implying that a woman is singing for her beloved, who, a man who has a vineyard, and it was beautiful, and all this, and how he took care of it, and that kind of thing. Well, what most people who are familiar with that text know is that it quickly shifts into a judgment genre by a prophet. And so what I picked up on is after the first two verses with triplet sound play, a, a, what I think is a different voice comes using doublet sound play. And uh, uh, portrayed as the voice of the vineyard owner, male, and he's singing about all the things he did to take care of his vineyard and how it wasn't going well. And um, so then the voice that I identified previously using triplets comes back and she starts, I say she, because over time I, I came to understand that this is a represented woman's voice. She starts singing about the vineyard also and then shifts to, because it's a religious text, God is withholding rain, and there's a judgment speech that comes after that. So um, not to get into too much of the detail, but that voice uses several triplet sound plays to great effect in this judgment oracle. So what I saw from this over time, not immediately, because I wasn't sure what I was seeing, is perhaps a prophetic dialogue or antiphonal male-female um, um, a piece of rhetoric in which, in the end, what they're trying to do is, is speak to the people that, you know, you're not acting right, you need to straighten up or else kind of thing. Um, so that I saw that and I thought, okay, either we have the different styles because of genre, a song versus a judgment speech. So then I thought, okay, how can I test this, right? Um, then I thought of Hannah's song. Hannah's song in 1 Samuel um, at least is representing a woman's song. Um, of course, in no case in my book or in this research am I trying to identify a specific person, you know, like the real Hannah from some point in history. I can't, nobody can really prove that a particular person, actually that's the song that they composed. I mean, that, that's not my, my, my aim, but rather to find women's, um, you know, tradi a tradition of women's voices and songs. So um, I went to Hannah's song, and very interestingly, as I analyzed the sound patterns, it was dominated by triplet sound plays. So, um, you know, she starts off by saying, my heart, my strength, my speech. Um, uh, Lee B, uh, uh, and in each case, the E at the end is the emphasized syllable. And, um, and there are so many triplets throughout. You know, the, the word key, you know, therefore, key, key. Um, there is no one like the God. Ain, there was no one like you. Ain, ain, three times. All through the first nine verses, pervasive triplet sound plays, until you get to verse 10, which is interesting because that's a text that a lot of um, commentators have suggested might be added later because that verse refers to the king who doesn't even exist yet. And so it's believed that maybe when that song was redacted into the book of Samuel, uh, maybe a line was added because because eventually you know the prophet Samuel is going to anoint the first king and etc. So, so what was interesting to me is that the first nine verses in this approach that I was kind of or this discovery that I was seeing, it actually played out in Hannah's song, and then maybe a male composer or redactor added a line in verse ten. Well, um, what happened was when I kept pressing on with this. Um, Another um, thing that I had to do was the Song of Solomon, for example, Song of Songs, presents a male and a female, uh, or more, more men and women also, there's more than just single individuals, but men's and women's speech in love poetry. So when I examined chapter one of Song of Songs, the woman's voice was always using a triplet sound play pattern. And the male voice, when he responded, was using a doublet sound pattern. So like, whoa, this, this really may be something here, you know, because it's, and this is a whole nother genre, you know. Of course, it's similar to the Vineyard song. That was, you could kind of see that as a love song. But you have poetic, or prophetic speech in Isaiah, 
that exhibits these two sound patterns. And now over here you got love poetry, right? So, but my goal was to look for women prophets. So I went back to Isaiah, and I kept going through the early chapters of Isaiah. And um, I came to chapter 9 and found alternating styles, triplets and doublets. Um, and uh, also in chapter 11, which is, to me, more, most significant because chapter 11 is this famous um, text where, you know, the anticipation of the king, you know, from the uh, shoot of Jesse, um, king will come, and um, the description of the king will rule in justice and righteousness. And, and then there's kind of a shift in the last half of the, the poem, which is kind of famous for this peaceable kingdom passage, um, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, etc., and so um, what I found in this is that the first part of um, chapter 11 was uh, dominated by the doublet pattern, suggestive of the male prophet, and then it shifted to the triplet sound pattern in the Peaceable Kingdom passage, which to me was exciting to see, because if this bears out that you know these two styles are being used by a men's tradition or a women's tradition, you know, then what we could have is a women, a women's tradition responsible for composing that really famous text there. And um, I can give you a few examples from that um, um, part. So for example, um, the wolf um, shall dwell, gar is the Hebrew gar, um, um, with a kid, Gedi, um, and the calf, uh, Eagle. So you got this G sound three times, and it's showing those three, you know, creatures, or two creatures plus the word for they'll dwell together, uh, Gar. And then, for example, another one is um, the lion and the fatling and the cow. And in the text, they're not always flowing just like that, but when you line these up, you get um, u kafir, u meri, u fara. So you can kind of hear the u sound is triplet, and then plus the, uh, the rest of the word, that, you know, they all have the r sound in them too. So sometimes you get more than one uh, consonant, you repeat it three times. And then again, another one is together, together, they're young. Three things, yachdal, yachdal, yaldehen. And so throughout this whole part, you know, this beautiful passage of these creatures that don't normally go together, you know. And that's the beauty of this triplet. It brings together things that don't go together, you know, to imagine this world of peace. So that was one of the more compelling, you know, findings that I found. And, I'm, you know, I'm still making my way through a lot of text um, to see what I find. You know, that, that's a hard question to even answer because what we have is a text. And um, there are allusions, you know, in some biblical texts to prophets who would, um, you know, use instruments, uh, musical instruments, and a, and a kind of process of the music somehow um, coincided with their utterances. Like in 1 Samuel chapter 10, there's a reference to that. Um, Carol Myers, the scholar, has talked about how women had a, had a, you know, a musical tradition and they often played hand drums. And, um, you know, Miriam is represented um, or suggested in uh, Exodus 15 to help, you know, lead the song, the Song of the Sea. But we have so little information that we can, we, it's, it's very hard to know exactly what, what it would have looked like. And to be truthful, you know, the, to what it sounded like, you know, um, the consonantal, the consonants of the ancient Hebrew and the biblical text, um, you know, we have in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have the Masoretic text, and the Masoretic text has the vowels, but we don't really know what the vowels would have sounded like. That's not so much a problem for what I'm doing because the repetitions, these doublets or triplets, are based on consonants. So no matter what, if there was a different dialect or over history, the Hebrew was pronounced a little differently in terms of the vowels, you know, you still got the, the solid ground of the consonants there, you know. Um, 
So it, I can't really answer that question. You know, one way in which to maybe test this would be for cantors to take these texts with the kind of script that I've tried to lay out where the sound patterns line up, you know, and as you go through and kind of recite um, um, what, what happens when, when the recitation takes into account these triplets or doublets. You see what I'm saying? It's got to affect rhythm somehow, you know. Um, and we don't even know whether prophets really sang or chanted, you know. Um, th there are songs embedded within prophets' books, so, you know, there might be a victory song or a praise song. We know that's probably sung. But in terms of oracles, like, you know, judgment oracles, um, were they chanted, were they sung? They're definitely lyrical. We can see that. But we don't really know, you know, what that would have sounded like. Um, I'm hoping the text itself will kind of evoke from people a re-performance today and see if, if we can begin to, you know, get at some of that sound. For one, we know there were women prophets. I mean, there, it's mentioned in biblical text. And the ancient Near East had women prophets. So, it, you know, it's not so surprising. It's just that we really, uh, except for a reference to Deborah in Judges 5, who said to sing a song with Barak, you know, um, and Miriam, who said to participate in the singing in Exodus 15, um, we really, and Huldah, she's attributed as having uttered an oracle, you know, in the book of Second Kings, um, that's, it's, it's, the, it's very scarce, the number of texts that are attributed, and yet we know there were more women that are attributed, more women prophets, so like Noadiah is mentioned in the book of Nehemiah, but we have nothing that she said, because it was just a brief illusion, you know, um, and um, so, so it's like they're, some are attributed, so, so they're present, but they're kind of obscured in the sense that, you know, more oracles, more speeches from them we don't have. Um, I tend to agree with Carol Myers, who suggests that ancient Israel was not really patriarchal, but rather androcentric, meaning not that men were in control of everything and did everything. And, you know, for example, patriarchal culture would probably not allow women to, to do much at all, you know. But an androcentric culture, which is more male-centered, was a little bit more allowing women to have some roles, you know. It's just that because of the male-centeredness, there's a tends to be a neglect when the canon is formulated of some of the women's utterances, I think. So, you know, a lot of people will say that Miriam's voice, she's included but obscure, her, her voice is obscured because only like one refrain is given to her. And, um, at the end of that song of Exodus 15. And um, most people, most scholars would say, well, she probably sang more than that, you know, but her voice was limited when that was recorded or, or preserved in the canon. Some think she had a whole nother song out there that we don't have anymore. Uh, there is a Dead Sea Scroll that, uh, refers to Miriam singing, which is a little different than the text that's in Exodus. Um, so there's a little bit of evidence that she was a singer. Um, but what I've done with Exodus 15 is said, okay, instead of just simply trusting what the heading says at the top, or what that later verse says about Miriam, let me just look at the text. And let's see what the text itself might suggest. So after moving through these other texts, I went back to these, these songs where women are at least attributed, and I started looking, and I did find alternating voices, to me, suggested by triplet versus doublet, back and forth. So what I, what I think is going on with the Song of the Sea in Exodus 15 is that you do have a woman's voice participating with a male voice in there, um, just based on the Hebrew that's right there, you know? Now, am I trying to say that was Miriam's voice? I can't say that because I can't prove, you know, any more than I can prove that Moses was the singer. You know, I'm not going to say that either, you know, or that a song attributed to David, a psalm he actually wrote, or, you know, we can't prove that. I mean, 
maybe the heading is attached because, you know, it's in the tradition of David and singers who came later said this is a song of David or of the Davidic tradition or, or maybe he wrote some of them. I don't know. You know, we can't prove. We just can't prove it. To say office, I think, is a little bit overly formal because, I mean, part of the definition of prophets, I think, is that the, tradi the biblical tradition overall shows prophets called by God, and so it can be anybody. You know, it can be someone who's from some little village somewhere who you would never expect to suddenly be raised to be a prophet and go speak to kings, you know, outsiders kind of. Um, and then, of course... It suggested usually that there were court prophets who served the, the, you know, the royal establishment, but not necessarily just serving the ideology of the king. But um, it's, I think that there probably were groups like that that were officially recognized. Holga, you know, you could say she was a court prophet. I mean, you know, um, Josiah appealed to her for an oracle in that context, according to the text. Um, so um, I'd prefer to kind of ask it as to whether or not I think women prophets were recognized as prophets. And I think so. I think so. I mean, there's enough just textual suggestion that that was the case. But I also think there was an informality to some of it so that you could have a whole group of prophets, including men and women, who just, you know, um, in the old, old parlance, it's kind of like a guild but I, I think the word guild is a little bit too heavy-handed. But a company of prophets or a group of prophets who, you know, were inspired and, and you know, sang. And, um, um, Will de Gaffney's recent book on um, women prophets, she talks about how, you know, sometimes when the male plural noun is used to refer to prophets, that because of the way Hebrew works, that can include women as well. So, you know, just because it's a male plural reference doesn't mean there were no women there. Just like you could say this, this group of people, you know. Um, so um, I think that's probably accurate. I kind of have to go back, I think, to my Hebrew, biblical Hebrew professor, uh, way back uh, when I, you know, he taught us. Um, he's told us that from the, from the start, you know, there are plenty of people who are going to say to you that biblical Hebrew is a dead language because, um, you know, at a certain point in history, it was no longer the spoken language um, because of the diaspora and all. And, and only in recent history has modern Hebrew, you know, been restored and you know a lot of continuities but but in terms of the long history but he's he told us you know I don't believe I'm, I'm not willing to say that it's a dead language you know in the way that you know a linguist or anthropologist might um, because he found in it kind of a living language that um, I don't know it was just the whole world and um, the way he taught it and the way I learned it was I could experience that livingness of the language, that it was fluid, organic. It wasn't like this thing that you scientifically studied and dissected, and it was just a tool or, you know, a machine that you took apart. Or, you know, but, but that, uh, I think part of it for me was that real people composed and performed these texts, and that in some way, if we can at least try to immerse ourselves in the language, you know, I also look at it as this is, this is an indigenous language, an indigenous culture, and um, just as today, if you wanted to go understand a culture in the world, if you can't go at least immerse yourself as much as possible in the language, then you remain at a distance as to what's going on, you know, because everything's based on translation and a removal from the culture and everything. Now I realize what I'm saying is a little bit problematic because how can we know, you know? How can we really know how it worked, what the full culture was? But I think we haven't done enough of that, immersing ourselves in, uh, in the language. And, um. I 
in a way, I've just started with this, so I have a whole lot of text to look at and see what I find. Um, um, and I hope that others will take the, the finding and apply it and see if it bears out in different texts they're looking at. Um, the example I gave from Isaiah 11, the second half of that, that, the passage about the peaceable kingdom, it makes me ask the question, would a women's tradition have had a special concern for that topic? Maybe, maybe not. You know, you also have the uh, Deborah, who was leading kind of the Israelites into battle. So I think one of the things I want to avoid is a stereotyping of women or men based on the, these findings. So, for example, um, on the one hand, it would be great if I found that within this women's tradition they were trying to emphasize peace. Um, on the other hand, I don't want to stereotype just because that's a wonderful topic, you know. Uh, or say that men's texts were all about war, because I don't think you know that's fair either. Um, so it's it's a it's a kind of difficult thing to look at in terms of uh, avoiding the stereotyping. And I heard a scholar gave a paper recently um, about you know you have to be careful not to polarize also male female, because today we deal with you know the questions of gender and. Uh, we don't want to stereotype too much about what, you know, just the two options, okay? So um, to try and be inclusive, well, when I, for example, when I um, looked at David's lament for Jonathan, that famous lament, um, when I looked at the sound patterns, what I found was a triplet pattern in the beginning of the song, which kind of suggests a woman lament singer. And then when it appears to me that David comes in and he's using a doublet pattern. So, and rather than just the song of, of one male singer, it look, even though it's attributed to David, it looks to me like there's some call and response antiphonal singing going on there. And what's really amazing about it is, is that he adopts the triplet pattern when he really gets into his deep anguish about Jonathan's death. He imitates what I think is a woman's uh, voice and does his own version of this technique of a triplet sound play. And, and it's a play on his name. Jonathan's name is what it is. And um, so you have men maybe identifying with women's expression or vice versa. And so I think there's fluidity. But at the same time, I think in the traditional culture, you had women practicing, you know, singing in a group, and you had men practicing over here. And so there was that division, I think. But... So I don't know if you're getting my point, but I think it, you have to be careful. I would never want to the findings of this to support some sort of stereotyping. I mean, it's more about empowerment, you know, empowerment and um, of what what these folks were doing when they were singing. Um, but as far as ramifications, um, I think it does make a difference if a woman composed a song and a women's tradition passed it on because women have had different experiences um, and, um, in the culture. And um, I think it's especially important for women today, for us to feel like, hey, we did make some contributions, or women in the past did make some contributions, you know, to what became the biblical text. I mean, I really think that this has a bearing on women's leadership roles. I mean, to me, the highest office was the prophet in the religious tradition. And, um, you know, historically women haven't always been able to hold positions of leadership, you know, in the religious community. So I think, I think the fact that um, my book doesn't highlight that. We already knew there were women prophets. But um, hopefully it will further along the idea that, that in the religious sense God called women to. And um, there's no reason why they shouldn't be out there doing you know, religious leadership work. That's a really hard question to, to like, name one person. Um, you know, I mentioned my Hebrew professor was really influential because he, you know, introduced me to the language as a whole world, an organic, you know, entity that, you know, there's so much dimension to it. Um, and I'd say um, he was my teacher also. Walter Brueggemann has been really, you know, um, an important influence on my work. Um, 
I think his approach, um, certainly rhetorical criticism and his socio-rhetorical approach, kind of in the Meilenberg school, there's a lot of overlap in the things that I'm looking at using kind of oral traditional method with that. And uh, even people who do literary criticism, the poetics, you know, there's, there's overlap among these different approaches. Um, but Walter was always taking a very liberating approach to the text. And he, I would say also, Dr. Brueggemann also often highlighted uh, women's text, you know, um, in a way that was affirming rather than, a lot of scholars would just assume there were no women's composed text. And so why bother to even look at them as women's text, you know? And so I think I, I really appreciate that. Um, but it's hard for me. I have there have been so many people who have really helped me along the way. You know, um, uh, Athalia Brenner and uh, Fuckling uh, Van de Kems, whose book kind of groundbreaking on looking for women's texts. You know, um, that just raised the question in a way that helped those of us who are interested in it. You know, have have a, an arena in which to talk about that. Um, Carol Myers, I mentioned, um, her emphasis on, you know, women's uh, singing traditions. We have evidence of that, and so there was a tradition. So it's a, so it gave uh, groundwork for. All right, let's look at, let's try and look at it more. Let's see what was going on with that. Um, Michel Caspi, you know, he was um, um, supportive of me, not my teacher, but supportive of my inquiry into the. Um, oral traditions, you know, and the poetry of this. Um, John Miles Foley, the late John Miles Foley, and several of these folks have passed on. Um, he just, outside of biblical studies, um, the whole arena of oral traditional method, um, he continued to champion for many decades. And um, um, in a, at a time when, in biblical studies, uh, oral traditional method, performance criticism now is very is getting you know very um, a lot of attention. Uh, there's been a, a long period of time where this this method has been kind of over on the side, you know, and um, I think with a, a, a kind of a return to uh, cultural studies uh, or, or a, re a focus on cultural studies, indigenous cultural practices. Um, almost in a postmodern sense, but, but, you know, a respect for traditions. And by traditions, I don't mean uh, everybody believes the same thing or is traditional, but the way in which people practiced traditions and yet innovated all at the same time. Um, I think this is, uh, this is, well, this is kind of where, where I'm landed right now. And I will say post-colonial feminist approaches like Musa Dube's work um, in Southern African cultures um, where she says just because there was, it was a, a male-oriented culture didn't mean that women didn't have, a, have roles to play, even leadership roles. And so, for example, one of her points is that, um, you know, we shouldn't assume women were absent all the time. So I took that in a way to, to look for women's voices in the biblical text, not to assume they were absent, but to assume they're present but they're kind of neglected or the canonizing process has kind of hidden them, you know. Um, and I'm afraid uh, Susan Neidich's work in oral traditional method has been important for me. Um, and um, so, you know, it, uh, and, and I want to say also, I know I'm, I'm, I'm not giving you one person, but um, I want to say that some traditional cultures where I've spent some time, like I spent a year in the former Yugoslavia right after the wars ended in the 90s, Croatia and Bosnia. And that was a place where some of the early scholars most people know about, Albert Lord and Milman Perry, did work on oral traditional singing of epic songs. And so living in that culture for a year and kind of appreciating, you know, the practices of people and their culture uh, and of course, the, the practice is not quite as prevalent as it used to be. But um, just just respecting it, and then I've spent time in South Africa and and, and learning about some of the traditional cultures there. And I want to say Cherokee culture. And one of the real 
insights that I got from trying to learn the language is they don't have a, an alphabet. They have a syllabary. And so attributed to Sequoia. And instead of when he tried to put the language into writing, he didn't create a, an alphabet. He created a syllabary. So each you know symbol, which we would think of as a letter, actually represents a whole syllable. So instead of just the B sound, it might represent ba, that syllable. So when they wrote you know, text and language, they were writing syllables. And when I was studying this in recent years, it made me realize, wait a second, let me go back to Hebrew in terms of syllables. You know, how are syllables constitutive of composition? You know, so I even, you know, this exposure I've had to these other cultures has really helped because, you know, you find these traditional cultural practices um, in some cases still at work. And it, it just opens up kind of my mind to possibilities, you know, um, because people in traditional cultures share some commonalities, you know.